Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches and Inspector Calls. In this short video, we're going to be taking a look at the character Sheila Burling and what she represents in the play. I'm going to talk you through the five most important things that you need to know about how Priestley presents the character. So let's get started. So who is Sheila Burling first off? Well, Sheila is the daughter of the Burlings and she is the person who actually has Eva Smith fired from her job uh, at Millwood. She's going in there trying on some clothes and she believes that Eva Smith is laughing at her as she tries on a dress that doesn't really suit her. And so she complains and has her fired. So first impressions of her aren't great, but she is the character that changes the most throughout the the play and that's why she stands for the younger generation um, as oh, she's like a symbol of the younger generation and their ability or their capacity to change their ways so Sheila represents along perhaps with Eric um, the sort of hope for the future and this is all tied in with priestly socialist ideology the idea that if actually everyone is more compassionate and more empathetic and looks after everyone else then the world will be much greater it is the opposite of the capitalist point of view that he's trying to criticize that man should look after himself one of Mr Burling's viewpoints so in this video we're going to look at those changes that Sheila Berlin goes through. So let's start off with how she is at the beginning. So certainly she comes across as quite naive, uh, definitely she comes across as very immature. If you just look at the way that she uh, behaves around her future husband Gerald, so this is the moment where he presents her with the ring. So you, you've got this kind of idea of someone who is quite sort of giddy in her excitement. Um, there's lots of exclamatives, you know, um, calling mummy and daddy. I suppose it's a little bit of a product of the time, but it is quite kind of childish in, in notion. Look at the way that she asks for mummy's approval. Isn't it a beauty with this interrogative or rhetorical question? You know, she's not actually looking for an answer there. One little interesting thing is when she speaks to Gerald. Oh, Gerald, you've got it. Note all of these hyphens that suggest this sort of fluttery girlish excitement. And then this question, is it the one you wanted me to have? Not is it the one I wanted? Is it the one that you wanted me to have? So we're starting to see the kind of dynamic between the two of them. It's very, very traditional uh, kind of patriarchal structure where he's got what he wants and she sort of is 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 pleased if his wants are fulfilled. Um, we also can see some of that naivety, some of that immaturity, and possibly slightly worse than that, um, in the way that she recalls her um, dealings with Eva Smith. The one thing to note, though, is that unlike most of the other characters, she does own up to what she, do, what she did straight away. But look at what she says as her justifications. She says, how could I know what would have happened afterwards? So sort of getting rid of the guilt. If she'd been some miserable, plain little creature, I don't suppose I'd have done it. So this tells us that her actions were to do with jealousy. Look at these adjectives, miserable, plain, little. So if she had been less fortunate than her physically, it wouldn't have bothered her. But the fact is she was very pretty and she looked as if she could take care of herself. So there's this sort of justification. It's very immature. It comes from petty jealousy. But this might be because Sheila is a product of privilege. She has been, uh, you know, she has grown up in this world where she gets what she wants and she's told that she's the best. And so she's threatened by anything that she considers to be better than her when her sense of self is threatened, which is what she perceived Eva Smith was doing by laughing at her. She's also a bit of a product of gender expectations. She's a product of privilege, but she's also a product of the kind of patriarchal structure that she lives within. So this is quite a big, chunky bit of text. Um, but really, this is the bit where they're talking about Gerald's um, absence, the fact that in the summer before he had sort of disappeared and it had made her feel a little bit uncomfortable. So the fact that she's questioning him actually does suggest that she's not 100% typical in terms of how a lady is supposed to behave at the time. But I'm quite interested in what 
the messages um, she's receiving from her mother are. So while she's playfully teasing him, Mrs. Burling says, now, Sheila, don't tease him. When you're married, you'll realise that men with important work to do sometimes have to spend nearly all their time and energy on their business. You'll have to get used to that just as I had. So there's an expectation that men aren't around, that men aren't in the world and women just put up with it. And that is a message that Sheila has been given by her mum. It makes us think, bearing in mind, we know that Gerald was having an affair spoiler I hope you did <laughs> um I assume you did um it makes us wonder well hang on a minute what what has Mr Burling been up to but the fact is is the message is you don't ask you don't criticize you just get on with it so she's a product of privilege she's a product of gender expectations however there is one thing that makes her different from the Mrs Burlings of the world she seems to have an inherent compassion for others. Inherent means it's like built in. So when she's telling the story about her and Eva Smith and the awful thing that she did, she does actually tell us, I've told my father, he didn't seem to think it amounted to much, but I felt rotten about it at the time. And now I feel a lot worse. So actually, Eva Smith recognised what she did was wrong at the time and felt bad and sought a way to make it better um, and now realizes you know just how bad it is and if you look at her response look at the stage directions this adverb of manner miserably so i'm really responsible that question isn't her trying to get out of it it's she's questioning it in that kind of sudden realization like oh my goodness i'm really responsible she takes the responsibility immediately, unlike other characters. And again, you've got this wonderful famous line. I've, I've popped it um, in an underline because I think this is one of those ones that needs to go onto a flashcard for revision. When the inspector is talking about the harsh reality of the world they're living in, that there are a lot of young women living that sort of existence in every city and big town in this country. Otherwise, where would people go for cheap labour? And we've got this wonderful metaphor. Sheila says, these girls aren't cheap labour. They're people. So the absolute antithesis of how her father um, feels about his workforce. So we're talking really early on. This is act one. Sheila almost immediately takes on the responsibility and the blame. She has empathy for those around us. And even though she did a dreadful thing, there's no taking that back. She recognises what she did was wrong, i.e. she has the capacity to change. And as the uh, play progresses and more truths are revealed, she becomes more assertive and more insightful. So the way that she talks to her mother changes. Note, she stopped calling her mummy now, hasn't she? She's calling her mother. Mother, don't, please don't, for your own sake as well as ours, you mustn't. And then we've got, again, I've underlined it because it's so flashcard worthy. You mustn't try to build up a kind of wall between us and that girl. If you do, then the inspector will just break it down and it will be all the worse when he does. This is so insightful. Sheila has recognised and understood what the inspector is there to do and is happy with that as an idea. And this metaphor of the wall is all about that social barrier in between the two of them. She's saying, no, don't make her distance. See her as a person. Don't see her as someone other. Likewise, when Gerald is telling his story about his dealings with Eva Smith, she understands why Gerald was attracted to her immediately. She says, again, look at this great little um, stage direction with sharp sarcasm. Of course not. You were the wonderful fairy prince. You must have adored it, Gerald. So again, Sheila sees, she's so insightful and she's not frightened of telling him. She understands that what it was that Gerald loved having about Daisy Renton, Eva Smith, was adoration, 
was worship, was someone that allowed him to stay on his tower um, and rescue her, which is why we've got this wonderful metaphor, the wonderful fairy prince. So certainly very assertive and insightful. What's happening is Sheila has gone from conforming to those expectations of privilege and gender and now she's saying no no more I'm going to challenge them so as the play progresses one of the big changes is from conforming to challenging and here we see it again where she commends Gerald even though she has said she's not going to be with him anymore or shouldn't really be with him anymore she commends his honesty and again she 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 brings it to herself so she still even after hearing all the other ways that people have been involved in eva smith's demise she still comes back to herself and it was my fault really that she was so desperate when you first met her but this has made a difference you and i aren't the same people who sat down to dinner here we'd have to start all over again getting to know each other so suddenly she's got a very different view a much more mature view of the relationship she's saying if we are to be together Gerald we have to be honest so Priestley is again giving us this really stark change in character and the last point to consider is how Sheila behaves after the inspector has left now we talk a lot about how Priestley is using the inspector as a mouthpiece as a, as a way of expressing his views about socialism versus capitalism but obviously he does leave halfway through the final act and you start to see Sheila picking up on some of those language choices she says to her mother, mother, I think it was cruel and vile. Look at how emotive these adjectives are. But it's not just that they're emotive, they are blunt, cruel and vile. This is a declarative statement, statement of fact. It was cruel and vile. She sounds like the inspector. So Priestley is using similar language. Likewise, there is something so declarative in the nature of um, her speech here where she is summarizing all of the different things that everyone in the family did ending with that's what's important not whether a man is a police inspector or not so after the inspector is gone she is the one holding on to the lesson and reminding her family of their culpability in eva smith's death and the most important bit of evidence to suggest that she is an extension of Inspector Gould, that she is almost a replacement for Inspector Gould, a lasting replacement, is the repetition of his emotive language. She says, no, because I remember what he said, how he looked and what he made me feel. Fire and blood and anguish. It's that triad or list of three. This emotive language, these terrifying nouns that are a metaphor for either hell or war all very symbolic of what's going to happen to people that don't start looking after one another so that's really it from me about sheila i hope that was interesting i hope that was helpful if you've got any questions about her character um, or anything else if you you've heard do just give me um you know drop me a line in the comments and i will come back to you i think the biggest takeaway from this is that sheila is the one that changes the most naturally you can debate about how bad her behaviors were but by the end of the play um she is so very different from the sort of immature naive accepting child that she is at the beginning thank you so much happy revising